Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Gina. I'm from Detroit. And um, I always like to kind of start with this slide here because it's an aerial shot of the neighborhood where we live and work. Um, we, my husband, Mitch Cope and I, and um, who's also my partner in this work. And I like to show it because in a lot of the media coverage that you'll hear about Detroit, um, the term blank slate gets thrown around. And um, I would challenge <laughs> any of those reporters to um, look at these photos or photos of the people who live there and who have lived and worked there for decades and still talk about our place with a very complex history, but amazingly rich history as a blank slate. And then I'd also say, like, who would want it to be? I mean, isn't it far more interesting to add new and, and exciting layers to, um, to this landscape or to what's gone before? Um, and doesn't that, you, don't you end up with better art and better stories and better narratives that way? So um, this is the neighborhood where we live and work, and this diagram kind of shows uh, kind of our, our primary strategy for working in the neighborhood. And that is that um, we like to strategically place um, our projects or other people's projects um, throughout, kind of like scattered sites throughout this neighborhood with the, one of the goals being um, increased impact, that we have very limited capacity and resources and therefore we want what we do to have a bigger impact. And one of the ways to do that is to have projects close enough that they have a relationship to one another but far enough away that then that impact sort of um, covers more geography. But all, it also allows, what's incredibly important, is it allows the people and the residents and the neighbors and their culture and talent and skills to also come through and for us to have relationships with them in the community. Um, and, and, and what it allows us to not do <laughs> is to create an arts district or anything like that or any kind of, um, I mean, I know we've done a lot of press coverage over the years and at the beginning people would start talking about like um, the artists that are coming in and creating, um, I don't know if anyone ever actually used the words arts colony, but it was very much, these are more closed-minded models that really talk about things that have insides and outsides and boundaries and limits and you'd have to transgress them, which is sort of all antithetical to what our, our desires are for the for this work and um, so I'll start with sort of the first project that we initiated in the neighborhood and I guess it was about 2008 and it's that striped house on the left which is still very much under construction <laughs> um, we like to say one of the luxuries we have in the city of Detroit is uh, time and space uh, which I'm sure New Yorkers can appreciate the value of time and space and so it allows us to work slowly and methodically and to uncover things that you wouldn't uh, normally be able to if you were under uh, real estate pressures, uh, these sort of other economic pressures. Um, what it means is that the property in our neighborhood is incredibly undervalued, and in a way we see that as an asset because it allows us to open up conversations about, um, about who defines that value and what that value is. And if, if real estate value and markets have no logic, in our place, then we can throw them out the window and we can have a new conversation about um, what value is more important to us as a community or us as artists or us as urbanists or architects or what, you know, whoever you are coming to the neighborhood. Um, we're kind of starting from a different point. We're not talking about flipping houses. We're not talking about making profits through real estate um, because that doesn't make sense here. <laughs> so, um, so what we do is we try to figure out, well, in each project or property, what is it that it c can bring value or can add value to this community? And each property kind of has a very unique story, um, but I'll keep this brief. Um, this, so this house is a front view of the powerhouse and the condition we bought it in, and we call it the powerhouse because it's an off-the-grid structure. It was off the grid, uh, meaning electrically and heating, power and electrical supplies. It was off the grid initially because it had been vandalized. So this is one of those situations where we take this negative condition that we found the place in and we turn it into a positive um, through both the literal and metaphorical model of um, DC off the grid green energy. So it's literally a DC structure. I mean, everything, it's powered by wind and solar. Um, this is uh, the first line for our passive solar heating system, which means that we cut a giant hole in the roof of our house and created, um, using solar power for the construction of the project, created a, a south facing glass wall that is our. It's the passive solar heating system, so it is the heating system for the house. Um, it, the ho it's also over, an over-insulated house. Like on, intentionally, we, we're kind of over-insulating the structures so that we can keep the heat that we made in the house. Um, and then it has a wind turbine and solar panels that what you saw so far is sort of the temporary construction, but now there's a permanent system in place. And so the whole thing um, also allows us to talk about decentralized 
st uh, strategies for arts and culture production and dissemination. So it's not about trying to get our neighbors to go to museums or, um, or go to programs that, in the existing cultural institutions in the city. It's about having artists, contemporary artists, working and living in the neighborhood so that um, neighbors and residents and visitors from you know, locally and abroad and internationally are able to see that art isn't just a product that gets placed on a pedestal or on the wall, but it's actually a process, and it's a process of failure and risk, and that's all okay and, uh, and actually incredibly valuable. So that's kind of a really quick <laughs> snapshot of the powerhouse, and then I'll just kind of run through three other projects that are happening in the neighborhood. So the powerhouse um, is actually a project of Design 99, which is Mitch Cope and Gina Reichert, as it's our own studio practice. And then in 2009, we created this nonprofit organization called Powerhouse Productions in order f to facilitate the work of other artists in the neighborhood. So this is Soundhouse. It's a house we bought from the um, a property tax foreclosure uh, auction. And, um, and we invited artists to come in the fall of 2010 to sort of just do what they do best in the, some of the properties that we owned. So this is Retina. He's a well-established artist um, in Los Angeles. And uh, he and Richard Coleman collaborated on painting the interiors of this house and really just creating this art, um, this painting installation that kind of took over every surface of the house. Uh, the next layer was John Brummett, who lives in the neighborhood and uh, had moved there from Chicago. Um, he kind of walked into the house and read and heard the paintings as sound. It was sort of like he had an, uh, an audio response to it because he's a sound artist, amongst many other things. And so John actually installed a series of transmitters, and um, there's a sound installation in the house that John created. He also um, started a... Uh, a musical instrument library in the house, and um, started a series of public events, including one that Cheeto Johnson ran. Um, Cheeto is a sculptor. He runs the sculpture department at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit, and he was born and raised and trained as an artist in Zimbabwe. So he uh, goes back and forth between Detroit and Zimbabwe all the time. And oh, uh, um, side note is that Cheeto si has since moved into the neighborhood and bought a house and has initiated his own project, totally independent of ours, which is great because we have. Um, no input or responsibility <laughs> for his work, called the Zimbabwe Cultural Center in Detroit. So um, another project to look up. Um, Squash House is maybe one of the, um, in terms of historic preservation, uh, uh, I don't know, success stories, because this house was slated for demolition by the city of Detroit. And I'll granted that the work I've been showing you so far, or the work we do in this neighborhood, deals with these very humble, modest wood frame houses. Um, they, uh, are easily disregarded by many of the powers that be as just vulnerable and an eyesore and blight, but they make up the fabric of our neighborhood. And um, you know, really, a lot of the work we do is about rethinking what we can do with these structures and what the role these structures have in our community. There's incredible collective memory wrapped up in them. Um, the whole neighborhood was built in the 1920s as sort of like factory, you know, housing to support the factories. But they're sort of beautiful structures. They almost all have hardwood floors and plaster walls and molding details. You know, very again, they're sort of simple, modest gestures in most cases, but they are what make up. Um, uh, you know, the residential neighborhoods of Detroit. And there's been a lot of um, talk of blight removal again lately because we got funding for that. And so um, the question is always like, um, well, some of these structures could be saved and possibly should be saved. And also, um, what happens once you remove them? There's a lot of like rush to demolition, especially every time there's a new administration because they want to be seen as the mayor that will take care of this problem. But there's not a lot of visioning beyond the removal. And so, um, uh, you know, we like to sort of <laughs> slow things down <laughs> and really think more strategically about, but then what comes after? We also don't want a series of empty lots that then there's a land use issue that also no one's really, or if people are just now starting to slowly think, um, I don't know, more interestingly about, in my opinion. So Squash House is one of the ho those houses that was on the demolition list that we bought at tax foreclosure auction, found out it was on the demolition list and, and went through a whole process to get it removed. Um, in part because, you know, their, um, their family is living nearby and honestly, um, you know, no one, no one tends to the vacant land anyway. So artist Graham White had a vision <laughs> to turn this house into a, a, well, a project called Squash House. And Squash House is squash both the sport and the vegetable. This is some of Graham's work in terms of what he does sculpturally and more like, you know, gallery and museum settings, but he's definitely got this interest and humor in sport, recreation, uh, absurd, um, absurd competitions, and, uh, and a play on words and language. So 
The name of this piece is Venue for Advanced Conflict Resolution, Battle of the Gods. And when it shows in gallery settings, he actually has ping pong paddles and balls there, and you are encouraged to play. A completely absurd game of ping pong, but people continue to try, and, uh, and it's super fun to watch. So the goal for Squash House is to um, create an actual squash court inside the front, you know, kind of two thirds of the house, and it just by, um, uh, I don't know, synchronicity is regulation squash court size. <laughs> and then the back of the house, which was badly fire damaged, um, to turn into a greenhouse. The great tie in with the community here is that um, our neighborhood is made up of primarily uh, immigrant families from Bangladesh, families who've been coming over since the 70s. But squash is a staple of their gardening, uh, these amazing trellis structures that they create every season, uh, gardening practice, and also uh, their diet. So the tie-in is also a fantastic one because not only are there many kids in the neighborhood who could use this space, whether to play actual squash, regulation squash, or a more absurd game of squash that Graham likes to call hyper squash, um, but also to um, create this greenhouse space and a space for seed exchanges and plants that um, the families bring over from Bangladesh. Um, this project has been mothballed, but we now have funding to move forward, and so in the meantime, we just painted it kind of a sporty color scheme that Graham picked up. But, um, Playhouse is maybe the furthest along, and in terms of being used, um, was a two-family, two-unit apartment house that we have since gutted um, for these guys, the Hinterlands Ensemble, who um, do kind of very physical theater and performance, and have been a great, amazingly great partner in the project because <laughs> of their programming. And so it's not just their program, but they've also created a relationship with the Bangla School of Music, which um, who they practice there every Saturday and Sunday, and they hold seasonal concerts. And so now we have an actual programming relationship with our Bangladeshi community, um, who we're also friends and neighbors with, but it's nice to actually share in their cultural um, expressions as well. And the last project I'll just quickly go through, um, I need to mention because it's the house that brought us to the neighborhood. So in 2005, Mitch and I saw this corner deli and uh, kind of fell in love with it and decided we were gonna buy a house. And um, partly because of the front studio space, which we promptly filled up with all of our stuff and, <laughs> um, and it uh, gets filled and emptied regularly depending on what projects we're working on. But this project, um, uh, was to put a Zen, uh, zen garden uh, uh, meditative space in the corner deli. It, um, it was a great deadline and prompted us to finally remove every last board of the board up, which we just kind of slowly piecemeal been removing as we could afford to replace the glass, um, but still keep these decals from the original, um, the Quolec grocery store, who was the original um, family that built the house in 1926. Um, and the great thing for us is that um, we kind of needed to like stop, and this was maybe 2000, 12, stop and take a minute and think about what we've been doing in the neighborhood and, um, and just show to our neighbors too that we wanted them to also stop and spend time thinking about the neighborhood. This is Ibrahim who um, lives down the street and is a great friend of ours and uh, he's Muslim, he's obviously not coming in to buy beer but he's coming in to ask us what we intend to do with this space and uh, what's going to be there and our response was, well Ibrahim this is it, this is sit and think and talk and let's like spend some time here in the neighborhood um, talking about what the future might hold.